Yeah. 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 They form particles, combine them all to make large objects. Now, there is a process by which we can do this. And that process is known as mechanical alloying. Now, mechanical alloying is exactly like the example I gave you of cipher, where you start with two different phases and then severe deformation mixing, mixes them up without melting. Just the deformation mixes up the phases. In mechanical alloying, this was a process invented by Benjamin in 1970. You take elemental powders, for example, iron, aluminium, titanium. Uh, you might want to put in some inert oxide particles. You put the powders into a cylinder, and the cylinder contains cast iron balls, quite large cast iron balls. And as it rotates, the balls hit each other with the powder in between, and they cause severe deformation, fracture, severe deformation, welding fracture, many, many times, so that without melting, you can produce an alloy. You then take that powder and you extrude it to form a larger, larger component. And you might then give it some kind of heat treatment, but this is not, not important from today's lecture point of view. So we are doing severe deformation, producing powders, and then joining up the powders using a process such as extrusion to produce large amounts of uh, large dimensions of material. Okay. So this is known as mechanical alloy. And one of the advantages of this is that because we are not melting, we can put larger concentrations of solutes inside our material than the solubility limit. So for example, if you take your cup of tea and you add sugar you get to a point where the sugar will stop dissolving. Okay. So you will not get it sweeter than the solubility limit. If you wanted to force more sugar into your tea, you would have to go to a high temperature and rapidly cool it so that it doesn't precipitate out. If it was a solid material, you could force the sugar in by mechanical alloy. It is incredibly sweet tea. Okay. Now, of course, the first thing I need to prove to you is that uh, <coughs> this process actually produces a solution because we are not melting the material. We are just deforming things so much that the atoms mix up on an atomic scale. And, and until uh, the work which was done by a Taiwanese person known as Sho, who used to be in China Steel. Yeah? What is this person in Seng? Oh, yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. That's right. He he looked at this material using the atom probe. I explained to you what the atom probe was, that we can look at individual atoms. So each dot there is one single atom. And then we can put an electrical pulse and pull out an atom and make it fly between two points. And the time of flight tells you what that atom is, whether it's hydrogen or whatever. Okay. So he did this experiment of mechanically alloyed uh, material, which is based on iron, and pulled out millions of atoms, one by one, to examine the structure of the solution that forms. And he obtained uh, many results, but this is one of those results, where we are plotting the concentration versus the chemical composition of 50 atom clusters. Of course, if I plotted the chemical composition of atom by atom, then you would get 0, 100% chromium, 0, 100% chromium, so that's not very useful. So here we are plotting the concentration of 50 atom clusters, 50 iron clusters. And you can see that there are lots and lots of variations. Okay. If you look at the scale here, we have something like 30% chromium, here we have something like 10% chromium. So the question is, does this mean that we haven't properly alloyed the material, because we have lots of variation of concentration. Or is this a completely homogeneous solution? And it's very difficult to answer this question, because of course when we analyze atom by atom, we will get a variation from 0% to 100%. If I analyze 
the average composition of two atoms, I could go from 0 to 50 percent to 100 percent. What we have to do is we have to say that, look, if I pick out 50 atoms from a completely random solution, what is the distribution of compositions that I expect? So that's called a binomial distribution. If our experimental distribution obeys the binomial distribution, then this is a true solid solution. It is not chemically heterogeneous. And Joe did this work where the black bars represent the experimental results and the white bars represent what you would expect from a binomial distribution. That means if we had a perfectly homogeneous solution, but we were picking out 50 atom clusters. You know, it's exactly like opinion polls. Yeah? Uh, if you went to the USA and you took one voter and asked them, are you a Bush or a Kerry voter? Yeah? And one of them said Kerry, then if you assume that 100% of the population of the USA is going to vote Kerry, that would be wrong. Because if you took 50 voters and took their opinion, you'd get a different answer. So just like that, when we take 50 atom clusters, we have to do a comparison against the distribution we expect for a random solution. And if you look at here, uh, look at these plots, there's very good agreement for aluminium, chromium, and iron between the binomial distribution and the experimental distribution. And what this means is that the mechanical alloying process has sufficiently severe deformation to produce a true solution. Those variations that you see are simply statistical variations because we are looking at small numbers of atoms, just like opinion polls. Okay, so the first conclusion is that we have produced a true solid solution by mechanical alloy. Once again, uh, you can see defects inside the material. These are, these are boundaries. Okay? Uh, so, we also produce an incredibly fine drain size. Not very surprising because the strain involved here is similar to the strain that we had in Cypher, you know, where we took 50 grams of material and stretched it out into 2 kilometers. Okay, now I want to examine the thermodynamics of this process of mixing up the atom to produce this very fine structure and homogeneous solution. And this is where, you know, interfaces really become important. Okay. In normal thermodynamics, when you look at equilibrium phase diagrams, there's nothing about interfaces. Yeah. It basically uh, ignores anything which is not an equilibrium uh, feature. So a defect is not an equilibrium feature, and therefore it doesn't appear on phase diagrams. But when we go to very, very fine grain sizes, of course there's a huge amount of surface inside the unit volume of material. And you can't ignore interfaces. And I want to show you that it has very major consequences on the thermodynamics. So I'll introduce this. First of all, I'm going to start with a very large lump of A and a very large lump of B. And the proportion in which I mix them is 1 minus x and x. So, so this is the atomic fraction of B and the atomic fraction of A. But they are large lumps. So if I put them next to each other, then the A atoms are not really seeing the B atoms and the B atoms are not seeing the A atoms because they are only in contact at an interface. Most of the atoms are far away from the interface. So this is what we call a mechanical mixture, not a solution. But although we have two kinds of materials, they are not feeling each other's presence. And the free energy of such a mixture is simply the average of the pure A and the pure B. And this is the average free energy. So there's nothing special about this. When we put large lumps of material together, it's simply an averaging process. There is no formation of a solution because most of the A atoms don't feel the presence of the B atom. A solution, on the other hand, is where we have a very intimate mixture 
of atoms, A and B atoms. So this is what we call a solution, where you completely mix the A and B atoms. Okay? So they are mixed on an atomic scale. And this was the free energy of our mechanical mixture. And even if there is no change in bond energy, when I break an A bond, and I break a BB bond to form an AB bond, even if there is no change in bond energy, I will get a reduction in the free energy. So this will be the free energy of this solution, even if there is no change in bond energy. Now, can you think of why I get a reduction in free energy? Remember that free energy consists of two terms. One is the enthalpy, and one is the entropy. And what I'm saying is that even if we have no enthalpy change, because the bond energies don't change, I will get a reduction in free energy. Why is that? Yeah, exactly right. It's the entropy. When I have two large lumps, there's only one way of arranging them, A and B. If I mix the atoms up on a very fine scale, I get a huge number of possible arrangements. Because the first A atom I can place on any one of the sites, the second A atom on n minus 1 sites, and so on and so on. And if I do that, it's a huge number of possible arrangements. So this is a very favored way of arranging atoms from the entropy point of view, and that leads to a reduction in free energy here. So this is the free energy of a solution, and this is the free energy of a mechanical mixture. So this you will find in all the textbooks on thermodynamics, either the mechanical mixture or the solution. What you will not find in any textbook is what happens in between this point and this point, where we go from large lumps to smaller lumps to smaller lumps to smaller lumps to, smaller lumps to an atomic solution. And that's what we need to address. The real process of mechanical alloying doesn't go from large lumps to a solution, but it goes from large lumps to smaller lumps to smaller lumps and finally to an atomic mixture. This is schematically what happens in mechanical alloy is that we have these large lumps of material, we put them together, we break them up into smaller and smaller pieces by deformation until we finish with an atomic solution. And we need to work out the entropy change in going from here to here. In other words, in between the mechanical mixture and the atomic solution. And the entropy change, how do we work it out? Well, we work out the number of possible ways of arranging these particles on the lattice. Just like we work out the number of ways of arranging atoms on a lattice. Is everybody happy with that? Ask me a question if there's something you don't follow. Okay, so, let's assume now we are dealing with uh, atoms, and I have capital N number of positions where I can place an atom. Okay. Then the first atom, I can place on any one of the N positions, right? This is my lattice. Consisting of capital N sites. Okay. Then the first A, first atom I can place on any one of these sites. Okay. So then I put the first one over here, and that's N possible ways of putting that atom. Okay. Now the second atom. I've only got n minus 1 sides left. So I could put it there, I could put it there, 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 but I can't put it there. So the second atom will be n minus 1, possible places. The third atom will be n minus 2, and so on and so on, until I run out of the A atoms. And then the B atoms I put on the remaining number of sides. So if you think about it, this is the total number of ways in which I can arrange the atoms in an atomic solution. N factorial is the total number of sites that I have. 
factorial means n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times n minus 3 and so on. This is the uh, number of b atoms, small n factorial, and the number of a atoms, n minus n factorial. And if I take the logarithm of this, that gives me uh, the configurational entropy after I multiply it by the Boltzmann constant. Now, when I, I'm not putting atoms, but I'm putting particles, particles consisting of billions of atoms, each particle. Instead of putting atoms, I put particles. I need a particle size where m with a subscript a is the number of atoms per particle of a. And that is the number of atoms per particle of b. But the method is exactly the same as I described on the board. Yeah. It's just a slightly more complicated equation. Yeah. I'm working out the number of ways of arranging particles of a certain size on a lattice. And then I can substitute into this very famous equation which says that the configurational entropy is equal to Boltzmann's constant times the logarithm of the number of arrangements which I work out from there. And this equation is famous for two reasons. First of all, it's very fundamental. It tells us the configurational entropy. And Boltzmann derived this equation. But nobody believed him, or, or very few people believed him. So he became extremely depressed, and he committed suicide. Yeah? So, you know, there's so much passion about his science. Yeah? I mean, I don't recommend you commit suicide, but it's nice that you are so committed to your equation. So if I just substitute the number of arrangements in here, I can work out the entropy. And you get this complicated looking equation for the entropy of mixing, but actually there's nothing complicated in this. This is the Boltzmann equation. This is the number of atoms you have in one mole of material. This is the particle size here. Ma is the number of atoms of A in each A particle, and B is the number of atoms in each B particle. And compared with an atomic solution, uh, this is the entropy of mixing. There's no particle size here because we are just talking about individual atoms. So if I go back to the previous equation, and I make the particle size equal to one atom, then those two equations become exactly identical. So one equation represents the entropy of mixing of particles of a certain size. And the other equation, which you find in all the books, is the entropy of mixing for an atomic solution. Okay, so we've now derived the free energy of mixing of particles as opposed to atoms. Because if I take temperature, multiply it by the entropy of mixing and the minus sign, then I have the free energy of mixing. Because delta G equal to minus T delta S. Okay. This is the entropy of mixing, temperature, and minus sign. And we are assuming that the enthalpy of mixing is zero because when we break an AF bond and a BB bond to form two AB bonds, there's no change. So we can now ask the question, okay, at what point do small particles, if you like nanoparticles, yeah, at what point do small particles start to behave like a solution instead of individual particles? Because at some point, you know, this entropy of mixing becomes large enough to, for the particles to feel each other's presence. You can't think of them as separate particles. This is very important because we are now dealing with very small particle sizes, not just in metals, but in the so-called nanotechnology where you make tiny particles of everything. So this is the free energy of mixing as a function of the number of atoms we have in each particle. Now, I have to decide, first of all, what is the value of free energy of mixing at which 
things behave like a solution? Well, I have decided arbitrarily that if I have 10 joules per mole of free energy of mixing, then that's important and the materialist mixture of particles is behaving like a solution. Why did I pick 10? Well, many phase transformations happen when the free energy change is only 10 joules per mole. So that is my, my own personal choice of the free energy of mixing when small particles start to behave not like individual particles but like a solution. And you can see that that happens when I have approximately a thousand atoms per particle. Okay, so we have to get to a very, very fine particle size when a mixture begins to behave like a solution. You can't think of them as individual particles. Very interesting result. Now let's uh, remove one of the approximations we made, which is that the bond energy doesn't change when I mix A and B. When I break an A bond, break a BB bond to form two AB bonds, there is no change in bond energy. That's not a good assumption. There is no, no material, no two materials, which I can mix without having a change in bond energy. Enthalpy of mixing is always non-zero. Okay. And there are two terms we need to think about. In ordinary thermodynamics, we just take account of the change in bond energy. But this time we are talking about small particles, so there is also a defect created, which is the surface of the particle, the interfaces. So there are two terms we need to take account of. And the smaller the particle becomes, the larger is the amount of defect I have. Okay? Because the amount of surface per unit volume, so this is the amount of surface per unit volume, is related to 1 over the size of the particle. As the size decreases, this increases rapidly. Correct? So if I plot a graph of the amount of surface per unit volume versus L, then it, it does this very, very rapid rise in the amount of surface as the particle size decreases. And, you know, this is really important to take into account when considering tiny, tiny particle mixtures. Normally we work in this region, where we have a grain size of 10 micrometers. But when you're talking about particles which are a thousand atoms in size, the amount of surface is huge inside a volume of material. Everybody happy with that? Okay. Oops. Right, so, first of all, uh, we need to work out the change in enthalpy, delta H, due to bond energy changes. Okay, so if I take an A bond, BB bond, and create two AB bonds, then I get a change in energy. And this, this uh, multiplying factor here is simply the number of AB bonds that I create by mixing A and B. Okay, so if I take that and I multiply it by the change in bond energy, then I get the enthalpy of mixing. So again, this is present in all thermodynamic textbooks, where you work out the enthalpy of mixing by seeing how many AB bonds you create, multiply it by this change, and that gives us the enthalpy. But when we are looking at particles instead of an atomic solution, we have a problem. And that is that we only see interactions between A and B in this very narrow region where the particles touch. These atoms are not seeing the presence of B atoms. So we have to scale this by the amount of surface we have per unit volume. So that's really important. Conventional thermodynamics gives you this as the enthalpy of mixing, but we can only apply that in the region where the particles are touching. Okay. So we have to multiply delta HM by this term here, the amount of surface per unit volume. And the second term we have to take into account is that the surface itself has an energy per unit area. So sigma is the surface energy per unit area. And that is a defect energy. 
When we take that into account, yeah, that will always oppose the formation of a solution. When we take that into account, we make a prediction that by breaking the particle size down to smaller and smaller levels, this term will become so large that solution formation is impossible. So what this theory is predicting is that by mixing these particles up and breaking them up to smaller and smaller size, you will never form a solution. And that completely contradicts Shaw's experiment where he demonstrated using the atom probe that mechanical alloying produces a true solution. So there is something wrong. Yeah? We have direct experimental evidence by a Taiwanese scientist, okay? which shows that we have a true solid solution forming on an atomic scale. And we have theory which says, no, it's not possible, because as we make the particles smaller and smaller, the amount of surface gets so large, the defect that you're producing has such a high cost that solution formation is impossible. Now, of course, if you are a theorist, then you will say there is something wrong with an experiment. But if you are an experimentalist, you will say, no, I'm afraid your theory is too simple. Yeah? And I think, in this case, the experimentalist is right, and I will explain why. Yeah? What we are ignoring is that the interface energy is not constant. It changes when the particle size becomes smaller. Now, why does it change when the particle size becomes smaller? Well, I want you to think of the opposite process, where we start with a very small precipitate inside a matrix and allow it to grow. Instead of mechanical alloying, where we start with large particles and we make them smaller. Okay, let's think about the opposite process, where we start with a small precipitate, allow it to grow, and see what happens to the interface energy. <coughs> Okay, so when we have a small particle which has a different crystal structure from the matrix, it will be coherent because even though the spacing here of the lattice planes is larger than here, you can force them to be coherent. So the interface energy will be small 